So in talking about imaging for intracranial tumors, we need to analyze the lesion. And we need to do that in a somewhat precise fashion. And we need to determine where is the lesion. And in this instance, I'm not talking about is it in the frontal lobe or the occipital lobe, but rather is it in the brain or outside the brain. We need to talk about the enhancement characteristics of the lesion as well as the overall signal characteristics of the lesion. So in terms of lesion location, there are certain clues we can use to determine whether something is extraaxial or outside the brain versus intraaxial. As indicated here, extraaxial lesions are going to be based along a dural or calvarial surface. Because of that, there'll be meningeal enhancement, either because the lesion is arising from the meningeal surface or there is a meningeal reaction to it. Realizing that there's CSF surrounding the surface of the brain between the brain and the meninges, we occasionally can see a cleft of CSF between the lesion and the underlying brain. A while back, Dr. George described a sign called the white matter buckling sign when an extraaxial lesion such as a meningioma would push the brain and the resultant white matter away from it. Realizing that the outer surface of the brain itself is gray, if we see gray matter between the lesion and the underlying white matter, we then also know that the lesion is not within the brain parenchyma. And likewise, the venous structures of the brain are on the cortical surface, so they will be displaced inwards as well. Obviously, the advent of multiplanar MR makes this a lot easier to do. The next thing we need to consider is enhancement and the enhancement pattern. When we're talking about contrast enhancement in the brain, what we're talking about is breakdown of the blood-brain barrier. We need to realize those areas that are within this cranium itself where there is no blood-brain barrier and we normally expect to see enhancement, i.e. in the pituitary gland, in the pineal gland, the choroid plexus, as well as in the meninges. What about signal characteristics? This can aid us in our differential as well. Typically on T1 weighted images without contrast, things that are going to be bright are listed here, blood in the form of methemoglobin. In our patient population, we see a lot of metastatic melanoma, so melanin is also bright. Fat signal will be bright as well. Calcification can also be bright on T1. It's thought to typically be dark on T2, but nonetheless, we can see that. And you'll find with the advent and use of more and more gradient echo imaging, especially at high field, i.e. 3 Tesla and above, slow flow will give us increased signal on T1-weighted image and shouldn't be confused with enhancement. On T2-weighted images, tumors we typically think of as bright, increased water content and being pathologic. We also need to be concerned about things that are dark on T2, blood product, calcification, proteinaceous material, very cellular tumors because of the very low or the very high nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio will have decreased signal on T2 and then flow voids obviously will be decreased on T2 weighted imaging. When looking at whether something is solid or cystic we can use these imaging characteristics to help us make that distinction. Early on on MR we had the uh, its imaging appearance based on T1 and T2 weighted imaging to see did the signal characteristics mimic that of CSF or did they differentiate. Then with the advent of flare, it became a little easier to make that distinction. Now with diffusion-weighted imaging and routine clinical use, we can clearly say whether something is cystic or something is solid. And then obviously if we see fluid fluid levels or blood fluid levels within a component of the lesion, we know that there is a cystic component as well. This, this is basically a table that's showing us the regional classification of common intracranial tumors. It's on the syllabus, it's a little bit busy, but I think the easy take home point is if we analyze the areas within the brain that we're talking about, intraventricular, pineal region, cellar, supracellar, cavernous sinus and the like, and think about the structures that normally exist there, we can then come up with an appropriate differential of potential neoplasms. For instance, in the intraventricular category, the ventricles are lined by ependymal cells, so we can get ependymomas, subependymomas. There's choroid plexus within the ventricles, so we can have tumors of choroidal origin as well and so forth and so on throughout this entire list. The next table basically shows us common primary intraaxial brain tumors, primary not metastatic disease, divided between pediatric and kids, and then further subdivided between supra and infratentorial. So in the pediatric realm, the most common tumors we see are infratentorial tumors, pilocytic astrocytomas, PNETs, or medulloblastoma, ependymoma, and brainstem gliomas. In adults, by far and away the most common 
tumor is going to be a metastatic lesion. This table, though, is just talking about primary lesions. In the adult, more typically are supratentorial lesions, and it's our range of astrocytic tumors, ranging from fibrillary or low grade up to high grade glioblastoma, and then mixed neuronal glial tumors. In the adult, a word of mention, most common primary intraaxial tumor in the infratentorial compartment is hemangioblastoma. Realizing again, in the adult, most common tumor would be a metastatic lesion. So let's look at a couple of cases before we discuss some advanced imaging characteristics and see if we can use any of these characteristics that we just discussed to help us in our differential. So here is a seven-year-old boy with recurrent headaches. We have a non-contrast CT demonstrating a fairly hyperdense mass in the region of the fourth ventricle. Maybe there's a little bit of calcification within this. It looks like maybe the temporal horns are enlarged as well here. On MR, we have a pre-contrast axial T1, a post-contrast axial T1. We can tell there's enhancement in the infundibular stalk, and we're also seeing some pulsation from flow-related enhancement in the venous sinus structures. And then on the sagittal, we also see this is post-contrast. And if we look at the lesion, again, fairly bright on T1, some areas of signal dropout, no real contrast enhancement. On T2 weighted imaging, both in a flare and then a second echo of a T2, it looks like the lesion is within the fourth ventricle, as best we can tell. There's some clefts of CSF surrounding it, very dark, with some areas of even decreased signal intensity and a little bright area. The diffusion weighted image shows us that this is a cystic lesion, as in the diffusion weighted image, we see no abnormal increased signal to suggest that there's restriction of motion. Anybody have any thoughts or ideas as to what this may represent? I'm hearing whispering, so we'll just kind of put up the answer. This is an intraventricular dermoid cyst, surgically resected and proven. So intraventricular dermoids are congenital tumors. They're benign, most commonly found in the midline, in the posterior fossa, or in the lower sacral coccygeal area. No sex predilection, well-developed fibrous wall lined by squamous epithelium that secretes a variety of substances. It can have any makeup of mesodermal origin as indicated here. They can be diagnosed with CT or MR. The density can vary depending on what's in this. This was composed mostly of hair and kind of gelatinous material. The MR appearance is also going to be varied based on what it's made of. Let's look at the next case. This is a 13-year-old girl who was complaining of a headache, and her mother noted that she was lethargic. These are non-contrast CT examinations of the brain demonstrating a midline supracellar mass. If we look at the density of the lesion, it looks similar to that of gray matter. We can see that there's significant decreased attenuation within the white matter of the frontal lobes. On higher cuts, we can see that as well. We can see that the margin of the ventricular system here is standing out. It looks like it's increased density. Now, that could be because of the lowered attenuation anteriorly, but if, there, if we then go into the occipital region, we can see that the same thing holds. So the process is involving the ependema as well. T2-weighted image, very dark, indicating a very cellular lesion with contrast enhancement involving the supracellar component, which is extending up into the third ventricle, and then the subependymal enhancement here. Anyone have any thoughts or ideas? Again, kind of mumbling, I can't hear. This is a germ cell tumor. And germ cell tumors are found primarily in children and young adults. Very real presentation, again, depending on the location. They can be locally aggressive. They're very cellular, so they're hyperdense on CT. No blood-brain barrier, so they will enhance. On MR, similar reasons. They'll be dark on T2-weighted image. Important thing is that they readily spread, either subependently, as we saw here, or through the CSF, so it's important to image the entire neurovascular system. And the last case we're going to talk about is a 56-year-old gentleman with seizure and right-sided weakness. Here we have T2-weighted imaging of the brain demonstrating some periventricular decreased attenuation. I mean, decreased signal, increased signal intensity, and immediately deep to that, actually lining the ventricular region is an area even darker. It looks like it's in the region of the corpus callosum, maybe even crossing over here. If we look at the flare image, we can kind of silhouette it out a little bit better. The area of decreased signal, maybe extremely cellular, surrounded by increased signal abnormality. There are some changes in the posterior fossa as well. 
All of those dark areas enhance with contrast, as seen here. The changes in the posterior fossa may be something different as they're not following the same enhancement characteristics. And if we look on a diffusion-weighted image, we see that those same areas have increased signal on diffusion-weighted imaging. This is kind of the key here. Does anyone have any idea as to what we're talking about? And this is primary CNS lymphoma. It's related to the vascular system, it's related to the corpus callosum, and has increased signal on diffusion-weighted imaging. In the adult, this tends to be a diffuse histiocytic type, typically supratentorial. It likes peri-CSF regions, deep gray, periventricular white matter. Hyperdense will enhance on CT, again, very dense cellular lesions. On MR, it's going to be lower iso-intense on T1, dark on T2, and again, potentially a stroke mimic. So let's talk about some clinical applications using advanced MR methods in evaluating intracranial tumors. And we can characterize tumors on MR using both advanced perfusion and spectroscopic techniques. We can use these methods to grade gliomas. We can use them to target surgical resection or biopsy sites. We can use them to separate out extraaxial non-glial tumors such as meningioma or possibly craniopharyngioma. We can use these methods, as we'll see, to separate out primary from secondary or metastatic lesions in the case when obviously they're solitary. Recurrent tumor from therapeutic necrosis, be it radiation or chemotherapy. And more importantly, use these advanced MR methods to monitor treatment, whether it's response or failure. And then to diagnose tumor versus stroke, and we saw an example of that in Dr. Law's talk this morning. We'll see that same example again in a little more detail, as well as separate out tumor versus stroke versus demyelinating lesions. I think Dr. Grossman had a slide of this as well, and we'll kind of review that again. In general, our routine tumor imaging protocol, this is MR-based, is as follows. The total imaging time, as you can see, is under 30 minutes. The patient will have an intravenous line started in advance of the examination. They'll have a scout. We'll do T2-weighted imaging, either a double echo T2 if the patient is in a head frame, or more typically a flare and a long echo, single echo T2-weighted image. They'll get diffusion-weighted imaging, plus or minus diffusion tensor imaging as part of research protocol. Based upon the diffusion and the T2-weighted imaging, perfusion imaging would then be set up using axial 5-millimeter slices. This is echoplanar dynamic contrast-enhanced perfusion imaging or susceptibility-weighted imaging. And these slices will be set based on what we see on the T2-weighted imaging or, obviously, prior imaging. The gadolinium is administered during the perfusion sequence, in which case is then followed by a post-contrast T1-weighted image. We can then do spectroscopic imaging, either 2D or 3D CSI, chemical shift imaging, at variable TEs, short or more typically intermediate TE of 144. And in Dr. Law's workshop this afternoon, he'll go over all of these spectroscopy techniques and methodologies. And that then can be followed, if warranted, with a 3D T1-weighted volumetric sequence. Siemens calls it MP-RAGE. GE calls it 3D FMSPGR. Total imaging sequence can be done in about 30 minutes, under 30 minutes or so. So let's talk about some of these clinical applications. First and foremost is the use of these advanced methods to grade gliomas. And here we have a typical example, post-contrast T1s and T2-weighted images of two separate lesions. One enhances down on the bottom, one does not. One's a low grade, one's a high grade. Can we use these advanced techniques to separate them out? Everybody knows the game. People play at conferences where the lesion you think is one thing really turns out to be the other. Well, that's going to be the case here. And what we did is we had looked at, in a scientific fashion, 160 patients prospectively that following biopsy determination or surgical resection were either high-grade glial tumors, grades 3 and 4, so anaplastic or glioblastomas versus low-grade tumors, as well as 160 normal voxels for the spectroscopic analysis in 16 control patients. And what we can see here on a perfusion-weighted image, so this is dynamic contrast enhanced examination, the relative cerebral blood volume of that non-enhancing lesion that we saw before was seven times that of normal white matter. That tells us this is a high-grade glial neoplasm. If there's necrosis, we would call it glioblastoma. If there's not, then it would be anaplastic astrocytoma. 
Whereas in a low-grade lesion, in this case, that was the contrast-enhancing lesion, the relative cerebral blood volume was less than two times that of contralateral white matter. I use the number two because it's an easy number to remember, and this shows us that it's a low-grade lesion. If we look at spectroscopic analysis and look at the choline to creatine ratio in the high-grade tumor here, it's two and a half times what we would normally expect, whereas in the low-grade lesion, it's 0.9. It's less than one. So again, using the number two for perfusion abnormality or choline to creatine ratio, we can separate out the, the distinction between low-grade and high-grade tumors. And you can see in diagnosing high-grade tumors, both in terms of sensitivity and specificity, using conventional MR, perfusion MR, or a combination of perfusion spectroscopy, we have our greatest diagnostic accuracy in terms of sensitivity with the perfusion weighted study at 95 percent. I should mention when looking at any advanced imaging technique, be it perfusion, be it diffusion, be it spectroscopy, you always need to interpret it along with the conventional images. We need to make that analysis first and then use the advanced imaging as an adjunct. And it's been shown by a variety of authors, some from NYU, some from elsewhere, that you can clearly with high degrees of significance separate out low-grade from high-grade tumors based upon relative cerebral blood volume numbers using approximately a threshold value of two. What about using these techniques to guide our surgical colleagues, either for targeting biopsy sites or for surgical resection? And if we actually think about what this represents, perfusion-weighted imaging is imaging of blood vasculature. And here we have capillary density. We're imaging the volume of the capillary bed within the brain parenchyma itself. And in glial neoplasms, these tumors secrete a wide variety of vasoactive substances that recruit their own blood supply. The greater the degree of recruitment of the blood supply, the greater the amount of anaplasia and neoplasia is present. So that correlates with the abnormal increased perfusion we see here. And then the representation is the azocarmine vascular stain of the anaplastic astrocytoma seen on the right. Whereas when we talk about spectroscopy and we're talking about high choline to creatine ratios and using this to target a biopsy tract, what we're looking at is cellular proliferation and cellular turnover. So the correlate between abnormal choline to creatine is what's known as the KI67 or mitotic or proliferative index. This shows us where these cells are increasingly turning over and are much more aggressive. It's also known as MIB1. Uh, some pathologists refer to it as that. We can use these methods to separate out nonglial tumors in the setting of extraaxial tumors. And various extraaxial tumors have certain spectroscopic signatures as seen here. For instance, meningiomas have minimal, if any, NAA because NAA is, if you go to Dr. Law's talk, you'll hear, is confined within neurons. It's secreted, synthesized in the cell body and travels along the axons as well as the dendrites. Meningiomas also have a well-described alanine peak at about 1.4, described by Mauricio Castillo and his colleagues down in North Carolina. What about separating out pituitary adenomas from interaxial lesion? Well, there are no metabolites, basically no NAA within it, and they're not that densely cellular, so the choline is not that elevated. Something we'd want to contrast it with is a craniopharyngioma, which is filled with crankcase oil. So there'll be a very large lipid or lactate peak. And we can use these methods to separate this out. This is a case of an intraventricular meningioma with a single voxel spectrum showing a very markedly elevated choline peak. Why? Because there's an increased cellular content and lots of densely packed cells. If we look in the area of about 1.4, we don't really see much. The important thing here is if we're looking at esoteric metabolites, and Dr. Law will get into this later, we need to use short TE sequences as opposed to this intermediate TE. We now jump to a short TE sequence. Again, choline is markedly elevated, but we're seeing this new peak, which is the alanine peak, at about 1.48, around 1.5, to enable us to say with fair, highly degree of accuracy that this is a meningioma. We can use some other perfusion metrics to separate out these extraaxial tumors as well. And in a paper that came out a couple of years ago in the AJNR, we looked at permeability in addition to relative cerebral blood volume. So here we have two meningiomas. This one looks fairly well circumscribed. This one looks maybe a little more aggressive. If you can see here, this is actually post-op and recurrent. There is some satellite lesions here. Both have elevated cerebral blood volumes, yet the last image is a permeability map. 
This shows us how much and how quickly the contrast is leaking across the blood-brain barrier even after the first pa pass. And what Dr. Yang and the colleagues were able to show is that in the setting of atypical meningioma or aggressive malignant type meningioma, there is a markedly elevated permeability that we don't see in the typical or non-aggressive meningioma. So if we kind of go over a summary of cerebral blood volume for various tumors, as shown by a variety of investigators, we can see that the relative cerebral blood volume will increase as the grade of the primary glial tumor increases. We won't see some of these changes with necrotic lesions, the tumor factor demyelinating lesions, and then some of these other lesions will have varied cerebral blood volume. So if we use a combination of perfusion-weighted imaging as well as conventional imaging, it can help us make this distinction. What about the classic lesion of separating out a primary from a metastatic tumor? You have an adult patient presents with a new onset seizure. There's a solitary lesion in their head. Is it primary? Is it metastatic? Can we tell? So if we look at the lesions themselves on conventional imaging, here we have a centrally necrotic kind of ring-enhancing mass lesion, a lot of T2 change, a lot of mass effect. It looks like the T2 change is going into the corpus callosum. Here's a smaller lesion, again, maybe centrally necrotic, ring-enhancing, T2 change around it, sparing the corpus callosum. So if we use what we're normally told, we would think that these are more vasogenic changes, and this is probably a metastatic lesion. This looks more aggressive. This is a primary lesion. What if we were to use perfusion-weighted techniques or spectroscopic techniques to help us? Well, if we actually look at the lesion themselves, the lesion itself, we know that it's going to be abnormal. It's going to have elevated perfusion because it has ele elevated capillary density, whether it's a primary high-grade lesion or whether it's a metastatic lesion, in which case there is no normal capillary bed. It's an aggressive capillary bed derived from the metastatic lesion. That's not really going to help us. But what about the T2 areas around these lesions, the so-called peritumoral area? In the setting of a primary tumor, what is that composed of? That's composed of an admixture of infiltrative glial cells that are also recruiting their own blood supply in their own capillary bed and brain reaction or vasogenic edema. So in that case, there will be increased perfusion relative to normal white matter, whereas in a metastatic lesion, the area will just be brain reaction. These tumors grow by expansion, not by infiltration, in which case the perfusion-weighted image will show us cerebral blood volume that is lower because the capillary bed is being constricted by the edema within the water. So just to reiterate, the peritumor region or this high signal on T2-weighted image in the setting of vasogenic edema is going to be water and no tumor cells. That's what we would find in a metastatic lesion. And in primary lesions, we're going to have infiltrative edema water, scattered tumor cells, and neocapillaries. So we would expect an increased perfusion-weighted image. So just kind of to show us, this peritumoral area has abnormal blood vessels and infiltrative tumor cells in the setting of a glioma, where the metastatic lesion is a clear plane of demarcation and just increased water content. And in looking at these patients, where we had 33 primary high-grade tumors, 18 metastatic lesions, we were able to show that on perfusion-weighted imaging, the peritumoral area of that lesion that we were thinking was a metastatic lesion because it was respecting the corpus callosum has a relative cerebral blood volume of over two times that of normal white matter. This is a glioblastoma. Yet the uglier, more aggressive lesion, the relative cerebral blood volume is clearly less than one, and this is metastatic adenocarcinoma lung. We can do the same thing with choline to creatine ratios, making the same analysis, the peritumoral analysis. And in that same study we saw in the glioma, the choline to creatine was over two, and in metastatic lesions it was less than one, highly significant, and they us to make this distinction. What about treated glial tumors? We see a lot of these day in and day out, patients that are on active chemotherapy protocols or had radiation, and we can use these techniques to separate out non-viable necrotic change, assess what's happening during the treatment, and make these distinctions. So if we see on a spectroscopic image or on a perfusion map that there are no viable metabolites, we can feel comfortable in saying that this is therapeutic necrosis. In this case, it was radiation necrosis. Sometimes we can't tell, and we'll have to follow the patients, in which case it looks like maybe this could be possible tumor. We see large lipid and lactate peaks, yet there is some choline elevation.
in which case only time will tell. We can't be 100% accurate. If we look at this treated glioblastoma from January to April, here we have a little bit of contrast enhancement, abnormal signal involving the temporal lobe, the insular, subinsular regions. And in April, what happened? The whole thing looks like it exploded. There's contrast enhancement within the thalamus, as well as all this extensive contrast enhancing mass. Our neurooncologists tend to be the ultimate optimist and say, well, how do you know this isn't therapeutic necrosis? So we can do both spectroscopic imaging or perfusion-weighted imaging, show markedly abnormal increased perfusion or marked spectral abnormality with marked choline elevation. So the choline to creatine is increased, NAA is decreased to show that this is treatment failure and progression of glioblastoma. We can also use these perfusion methodologies to show us and follow patients on active treatment protocol and to show us changes that we wouldn't otherwise see. Here we see a patient with a recurrent glioblastoma being treated with high-dose chemotherapy with thalidomide at the start of their treatment, kind of ugly, heterogeneous mass. The patient's obviously post-op. There's mass on both sides. The corpus callosum is involved, marked perfusion abnormality. Two months into treatment, the conventional imaging starts to look a lot better, as does the perfusion-weighted image. There's less mass effect. Four months, if we just look at the conventional imaging, things look like they're even better. But look, there's now this new area of abnormal perfusion that wasn't seen before or even on the initial area. This is tumor progression. A month after this, the patient had a massive left frontal recurrence and expired. So in this case, the perfusion-weighted techniques were showing us techniques in advance of conventional treatment. Here we see a recurrent glioblastoma. It was a bifrontal lesion with new contrast enhancement in the spleneum of the corpus callosum with abnormal signal as well. Both spectroscopic imaging as well as perfusion-weighted imaging can tell us that this is not treatment effect, but rather tumor progression. And the last thing we'll talk about is differentiating tumor from stroke versus tumor factor demyelinating lesions. And this is that example that Dr. Law showed. This was a patient that presented with a two-week history of progressive waxing and waning neurologic signs and symptoms referable to the left MCA territory came in with this non-contrast CT. There's mass effect. It's heterogeneous. Maybe there's some increased density here, suggestive of some blood product. Ugly contrast enhancing mass. A lot of some localized mass effect. T2 signal abnormality, both on the T2 and on the flare. I should note that our flares, in this instance, this was the initial study, was performed post-contrast. Some of this abnormal signal is related to the gadolinium enhancement. We did both diffusion-weighted imaging and perfusion-weighted imaging, showing that there were some diffusion abnormalities in this lesion, as well as some perfusion abnormalities that were suggestive of areas of decreased perfusion, as well as areas of increased perfusion. Here on the color maps, there's delayed or increased mean transit time and time to peak. And if we look at some of the perfusion characteristics on the curve, there's clearly abnormal increased perfusion here. The yellow curve is at this part of the lesion. The normal comparison is here. We can also see that some of the areas are shifted out towards the right, indicating delayed perfusion. So this became somewhat of a conundrum. Is this tumor? Is this stroke? She's got a two-week history. She's 40-something years old. We did the spectroscopy, and I think Dr. Law showed this again this morning. And the take-home point here is if we look at the normal area, we see basically kind of a normal pattern, choline to creatine. If we look in this area, the choline is markedly elevated as compared to the creatine. The NAA is down. It looks like there's lipid and lactate. One would say, oh, this is tumor with a tumor signature. But if we look at the scale of the spectral, the spectra itself, the computer automatically adjusts this for us. And this scale is going up to 0.06 whereas the scale in the normal brain is 0.15. The scale is half that over here, so we are artificially separating out these spectral curves. And if we actually look at the map, the overall metabolite pattern is decreased in this setting. So while our ratios might be abnormal, total metabolites are decreased. And that enables us to make a distinction and make a diagnosis of infarct. And this patient was having a progressive infarct, and it wasn't necessarily tumor. What about this instance? Here we see this kind of butterfly glioma type lesion. I think a take home message here is the type and pattern of contrast enhancement. These are somewhat horseshoe like or halo like patterns of contrast enhancement. The portion within the corpus callosum itself is not enhancing. 
If we look at the spectral maps, there is some marked choline elevation, yet there's not a lot of abnormal perfusion within this, and this turned out to be a tumor factor demyelinating lesion. As in the example that Dr. Grossman showed, with tumor factor demyelinating lesions, since it is a perivenular process, we can actually see the dilated venous vascular structures running through the lesion itself. We typically don't see that in the setting of neoplasm. So you can use that criteria as a distinction as well. So I think just to sum up, when looking at intracranial tumors, it's important to take a lot of things into consideration, the patient demographics, age, sex, clinical history, short onset, not onset. Most important is the conventional imaging. We need to rely on that and then use the advanced techniques of both perfusion and spectroscopy to aid our diagnosis and supplement what we learn on the conventional imaging. Thank you.